The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, April 13th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, journalist Catherine Stewart on the power worshipers inside the dangerous rise of religious nationalism. Meanwhile, Donald Trump mad at Dr. Fauci He's also looking to complete a conservative dream of destroying the post office. Meanwhile, confusion and failure mark the Paycheck Protection Act. And those emergency funds keep waiting. Schumer and Pelosi seem absolutely determined to put the Dems' weakest foot forward in the phase four bailout, despite the fact that how suddenly offended they were by the Wisconsin voting situation. Meanwhile, food shortages and waste, the story of a messed up supply lines and failed workplace safety laws. In New York, de Blasio cancels schools. And then 15 minutes later, Cuomo tries to reverse. In Virginia, Northam makes Virginia, or I should say institutes, the most democratic voting reforms arguably in the nation. Lastly, chloroquine study in Brazil halted over fail... uh, fatal heart complications. All this and more on today's program. Nice, uh, nice five second fade there. Um, uh, Brendan, I appreciate that. Uh, we're all here. Um, every day is a new set of technical challenges. Uh, you might be able to hear a Matt, uh, slamming away at his keyboard, uh, trying to figure out, (laughs) get sound out of his computer. Uh, hopefully you're hearing the sound of my voice. Uh, Brendan and, um, uh, and, uh, and Matt are here. Um, and um, we will get to all this. I hope uh, everyone uh, made it through uh, the weekend. Um, there seems to be some leveling off, you know, broadly speaking in the country, but uh, places like Michigan are starting to hit new highs as the um, as the, I wouldn't say the epicenter yet of, uh, the, the, the outbreaks have moved at this point. Still, I think New York, um, remains the most problematic place in the world at this moment. Anyways, uh, Sweden, which had been pursuing a fairly lax perspective on this is now shooting up having problems on a per capita basis. We'll keep our eyes open for that. There's been some reports of a a resurgence, small one in China since things loosened up. We will keep uh, our eyes on that for you. And then, you know, endeavor to um, uh, continue on with our our various types of programming that we've been having on this program since uh, day one, in many respects. Uh, We will do the uh, plugs and updates at the end of the show. Just a, a little bit of house cleaning. The godfather of this program, 
Kyle from Fans FM FM has now updated the apps again. Not only is there a huge amount of functionality that's there, not only has he instituted a system so that if you're having uh, problems with your membership paying for it, you go, you cancel, we give you automatically some other options. There are now push notifications on the app. We're not going to blast uh, these notifications. Right now, maybe once a day, we'll let you know what's going to be on the show. If something, if I hop on uh, on YouTube, we'll send out a blast. Of course, via the app, you can watch the show on YouTube live. You can stream the audio live. You can IM the show. And I think he's working on a special members-only hotline through the app. But you don't need to be a member to get the app. You can go to majorityapp.com. It's free for everybody. It gives you all those things. And the the AM Quickie is on there. Uh, And you can also um, become a member of the show. And it has a searchable database of all the shows all, what are we at now? 3,000 shows close to it. And you can find those and you can become an, a member of the program at jointhemajorityreport.com. Um, not going to lie, our ad revenues, and this is across the board, I imagine this is the case for every show, have gone down pretty dramatically over the past month. Um, and so, uh, and, and of course, um, we have members who have lost their jobs who anticipate losing their jobs, um, et cetera, et cetera, or have some have gotten ill and uh, so have been unable to maintain their memberships. We will not lock anybody out for money. Uh, that's always been the policy here since day one of this program. Uh, so if you want the show, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com and uh, just let us know and give us a little time. We will hook you up if you cannot afford it. If you can afford it, and you've been meaning to become a member, now's a good time. Join the majority Uh, Donald Trump, and there's more and more reporting to this effect. He's really just looking at his ratings for his, you know, little show he does every day, which is, you know, uh, you know, not unlike the other shows that are on television that are also fictional, largely fictional. And, um, Apparently, he's getting a little mad because his co-star, uh, Dr. Fauci, is getting better reviews than he is. And so um, the reporting was that over the weekend, he spent a lot of time asking people around him, like, what do you think about Fauci? Like, almost like looking for someone to give him the idea you should fire this guy. Which is a terrifying thought at this point. Um. Here is Donald Trump saying he wants to reopen the economy. What is this based upon? Obviously, there's a need to get things going, but every it seems every single expert that I have read, the first thing they say is we need testing capacity. For some reason, there are other countries in the world that have been able to roll this out. We seem totally incapable of it. And now there's reports of the swabs that they use are starting to uh, suffer shortages. We need to have testing before we get back to any semblance. It's not going to be normal, any semblance of normalcy. But Donald Trump has another plan, sort of like that secret plan to win Vietnam. Here is a a clip of uh, Donald Trump on Friday at his uh, White House press, presser, I guess. Obviously, a lot of interest in how you're going to make that decision. What? Yeah. What? It's a very big decision. What? I don't know that I've had a bigger decision than that. When you think, right? I, you would think. Think. I mean, think of that decision. Somebody said it's totally up to the president. I saw this one. It's totally up, and it is. I don't know that I've had a bigger decision, but I'm going to surround myself with the greatest minds. Uh, not only the greatest minds, but the greatest minds in numerous different businesses, including the business of politics and reason and we're going to make a decision and hopefully second. it's going to Pause be it for one second they're asking like what when you know how are you going to go about make this uh decision to open up the country now look the reality is donald trump can get up there and say the country is now open for business 
but he doesn't really have any authority um, other than guidance to offer. The states are have been issuing these pause orders, and they're the only ones that can basically roll them back. But he's been talking to uh, leaders of, of the business of politics and reason. And uh, what will he get, garner from all these people? Well, we're going to find out. Numerous different businesses, including the business of politics and reason. And we're going to make a decision, and hopefully it's going to be the right decision. I will say this. Uh, I want to get it open as soon as we can. We have to get our country open, Jeff. Can you say, sir, what metrics you will use to make that decision? Uh, the metrics right here. That's my metrics. That's all I can do. I can listen to 35 people. At the end, I've got to make a decision. And I didn't think of it until yesterday. I said, you know, this is a big decision. But I want to be guided. I'm going to be guided by them. I'm going to be guided by our vice president. I'm going to make a decision based on a lot of different opinions. Some will maybe disagree and some I'd love to see it where they don't disagree. Will there be risks? There's always going to be a risk that something can flare up. There's always going to look. Uh, look at what's happening where countries are trying to get open and there's a flare up and they'll go. But I'd like the flare up to be very localized so that we can control it from a local standpoint without having to close. You know, before we get to the substance of what he's talking about, which is that he doesn't know what the word metrics means. Um, and doesn't seem to have any type of benchmarks that he's willing to share with us, which I imagine are is just simply polling. Can you imagine if we were in the throes of a pandemic and what will be a huge economic disaster for the country if Barack Obama came out wearing a pink tie? I may be a little bit sensitive to it only because uh, <laughs> back in the day, Rush Limbaugh would complain about the wussification of America as in, you know, as indicated by Dick Durbin's pink tie. And we had a caller who called in about Dick Durbin's pink tie. And this was the type of issues at the time that would dominate the, the press for like a day or two. Barack Obama's tan suit. And this guy is uh, wearing festive ties in the midst of his, um, of his of his TV show, I don't really care, but it just uh, I don't know why I couldn't help but notice that. But the idea that the metrics are all in his head, he's not going to share them with us, or they don't exist. And he only thought about it yesterday that this is a big decision. This is his way of saying it's my decision to make. I mean, this is all totally marketing for him. This is all about creating an image where he's got, he's got the whole world on his shoulders and I can handle it. And they've coached him well to say now, like, you know, take the advice of these other people, but that I'm not convinced that he's not trying to intimidate those other people. It's time for you to get on board with my idea of when we should open. What are the metrics? Whatever I wake up in the morning and think like, Hmm, what's happening in terms of my reelection. I mean, at one point, he is going to make the determination that it's all or nothing. It's Trump or bust. And he's going to say, like, if I can't get the economy going now, and I, then I'm going to lose. And if that's the case, I'd rather lose trying than not. And the trying is going to be, in other words, with the risk of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100,000 deaths, maybe more. I don't know. So uh, Donald Trump, ladies and gentlemen, you're president. Here's a message from our sponsor, ZipRecruiter. They say right now we cannot be overwhelmed. We have to work to keep our loved ones safe and protect our communities. We have to work to stay strong 
to stay connected, to stay focused. We have to work to inspire, to innovate, to build new solutions. But for all of this to work, we have to work together. ZipRecruiter connects employers and people every day, but today is different. ZipRecruiter is partnering with first responders, government officials, the medical community, the innovators in the manufacturing, transportation, and food distribution industries to make sure they're finding the right people for the right jobs right now. Let's work together. ZipRecruiter.com slash work together. All right, folks. Going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we will be talking to Catherine Stewart about the power worshipers inside the dangerous rise of religious nationalism. And this is coming uh, after an Easter weekend where the DOJ basically threatened mayors and um, other state and local officials to not interfere with, um, with Easter services. because it might increase the infection rate uh, within these uh, towns and, and counties. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Sam Cedar, Majority Report. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Catherine Stewart. She is the author of The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. She is a reporter, also uh, writing opinion pieces for the New York Times. Catherine, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Catherine, I want to just start with uh, getting a sense of uh, or letting folks know um, what was involved in reporting this? This has been a long time project for you. That's true. I mean, the first, I, the book was really uh, the consequence of 10 years of research into this area. Um, it's kind of a deep dive into the leading personalities and uh, policy organizations of this movement that's turned religion into a tool for political power. Um. You, uh, in, in much of the book is written, well, I shouldn't say, it, it, there's a lot of first person, I think, experiences uh, as you go around um, uh, the country and, um, and, 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 and visit these people. But let's just start, too, with why you refer to uh, these folks as Christian nationalists as opposed to the Christian right or uh, religious conservatives, et cetera. 
Right. I mean, the first thing to know about Christian nationalism or religious nationalism is it's not a religion. It's a political ideology. Um, its representatives uh, insist that the foundation of government is bound up with the reactionary understanding of religion. Um, I use the term nationalism because it bears similarities with other forms of religious nationalism around the world. And I call it Christian nationalism, obviously, in deference to their own understanding of the religion that they're promoting, which is uh, which they say is a uh, Christian. But um, I also use terms like uh, Christian right and religious right where appropriate. Uh, I often prefer religious nationalism in referring to the whole specifically because it does bear similarities to other forms of religious nationalism. So if you look around the world, like like in Turkey or Russia or Erdogan, um, I'm sorry, in Orban and Hungary, when they bind themselves tightly, these you know the lead leaders that bind themselves tightly to religious conservatives in their countries in order to consolidate an authoritarian form of power, we rightly recognize that as a form of religious nationalism. And that's what we're, we're seeing today with uh, Trump's alliances with our own hyper conservative, with these hyper conservative religious leaders. Um, I'm trying to figure out if I should add, uh, let's start with uh, abortion because I, for many years, I mean, I've been talking about um, some variant of these folks, right? And um, and this, and they were particularly um, more public, it feels like, during the Bush administration than they are now. But my sense is that they're more powerful now than they were then. And so I had, you know, I, I had been aware of the genesis of abortion as a political, um, as a as a real political uh, issue, but I had not seen the quotes from Billy Graham, or uh, no, I had known the stuff about the Baptist press. Go through that because, and also tell the story about Bob Jones uh, University. Because I, I'm very curious. I mean, after we we discuss that, I want to get you know, I want people just to have this in the back of their mind. This question of, you know, which comes first for these specific set of people: the drive for power, or the or or the the drive of religion? I guess. But let's let's first start right. with abortion. Right. Well, uh, the. Religious right has sold us this idea that their movement was a grassroots reaction to abortion, as you said, but one of the key issues that actually animated the movement in its earlier days was the fear that racially segregated academies might be deprived of their lucrative tax exemptions. So Jerry Falwell and many of his other Southern white conservative leaders were very closely involved with segregated Christian schools and universities. Jones senior, who one of them went so far as to call segregation God's established order. He actually referred to desegregationists as satanic propagandists who were leading colored Christians astray. He delivered a, a, a sermon called Is Segregation Scriptural? It's incredible. You can look it up. It's actually footnoted in my book. I mean, as far as he and these other pastors were concerned, they had a right not just to separate people on the basis of color, but also to receive federal money for the purpose. So they coalesced around this fear that the Supreme Court might end these tax exemptions for segregated Christian schools. But they, you know, they were trying to unite a new movement. They, they were, at the, these were leaders of an org, uh, a, a sort of intellectual movement called the New Right. And they really wanted to bring together conservative Catholics, conservative um, evangelical Protestants, and also some other groups. And they knew that sort of stop the tax on segregation wasn't really going to be an effective rallying cry uh, and unite a hyper-conservative revolution. So there's this fascinating episode where they got together and basically went down a laundry list of issues they thought might unite their new movement. And this was in 1979, six years after Roe v. Wade had been passed. So again, you know, they worried about the tax privileges of racist academies, but that wasn't going to work. They were also really worried about women's rights and the women's movement, but they sort of realized, they settled eventually on this idea that uh, they could unite around the issue of abortion and basically said, well, that could work. So, I mean, let, let's look at the sort of overtime piece of this. When Roe versus Wade was passed, most 
Protestant Republicans supported it. They supported some form of abortion law, uh, liberalization. So, um, you know, the in the Baptist press, they published uh, an editorial uh, hailing the decision. This was uh, a press that was run by the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, Ronald Reagan passed the most liberal abortion law in 1967. Conservative hero Barry Goldwater supported abortion law liberalization, at least early in his career. And my favorite fun fact is that his wife, Peggy, was a co-founder of Planned Parenthood in Arizona. Can you imagine that happening with any conservative leader today? But over time, these pro-choice voices were purged from the Republican Party. So we're seeing today kind of pro-life religion. It's a modern creation. It was created for political purposes. The reason it was created because the Republican and leaders and Christian nationalist leaders know that if you can get people to vote on a single issue or one or two issues, you can capture their vote. And that's why they've invested an enormous amount of energy in messaging and media uh, in trying to promote the idea of you know, abortion restriction and abortion elimination as the single most important issue of their time. When people are voting for abor uh, against abortion, you know, when they're voting for those hyper-conservative candidates that promise to end abortion, they're also voting for a whole panoply of right-wing and libertarian economic policies and get people to sort of ignore all that and get them to vote on this one issue. So, I mean, I, I without, I mean, I, I, you know, let's just assume, um, and I think it's a fairly safe assumption, some level of sincerity amongst those who vote based upon abortion. I'm curious as to the, the your sense of the sincerity of uh, of these power brokers as to the issue. Yeah, well, I think you know when the leaders of the movement are talking to the rank and file, or when they're talking to pastors about the issues, they should communicate to their rank and file in order to turn out the vote. It's all abortion all the time. Abortion is the beginning and the end. But um, when the leaders are speaking to their political allies, and also uh, especially to their plutocratic funders, they're advocating a very wide range of policy positions. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with money, and they justify it through religious rhetoric. So it's all about how the Bible supports low taxes for the rich or no taxes, how the Bible supports minimum regulation of business or no regulation, how the Bible is against environmental regulations. So this drives home the fact that this is a political movement, a broad political movement, and not just a stance in the so-called culture wars. And, you know, we were talking about what the rank of, you know, feel, and many people sincerely want to end abortion. And listen, I think it can take any number of nuanced positions on this issue and not um, yourself uh, or not think of yourself as a Christian nationalist. But if you are allowing this one single issue to determine your vote, you are lending for uh, an, an agenda of religious nationalism, and you are supporting politicians that are going to support policies that are going to um, end up uh, having uh, less support for the poor, uh, less envir fewer environmental regulations, uh, promoting policies like you know lack of access to birth control, things like that, which are going to end up in an increasing number. You know, this is just going to complicate the. Um, so which, I mean, what, what is your sense about what is driving uh, these folks in terms of, of the political movement? I mean, is it, is it power? And I'm talking about the leadership here. Is it simply power to, you know, which ultimately, um, power, which ultimately, you know, I think, centers around money and the institutional power that the, these organizations have, which is also a function, again, of, uh, of how much money they're able to generate and how much influence they have within the power. Is it, is it power that's driving it, or are they, is it, is it a, um, a, a quest for power driven by religion? Is, that, is it even really relevant to ask the question? No, it's absolutely a legitimate question. It's, um, it's all of the above. It's uh, power for themselves, their political allies. It's a, a far right kind of economic policies that's going to uh, help enrich many of their plutocratic funders and reorganize society. And certainly it's about uh, justices in the Supreme, uh, Supreme Court and federal. Last time I checked, 
uh, Trump had appointed 192 federal judges. That's over 22% of the federal judiciary. So the courts are stamped with the consequences of that 2016 election. You know, uh, Christian nationals understand the importance of, uh, of capturing the courts. And that's how many of them have justified their support for a leader like Trump. But there's more than that. I think that, you know, the movement is profoundly anti-democratic. They don't seem to have much respect in representative government or even the two-party system. And they seem to long for a more authoritarian form of power. And that's another reason why they support a leader like Trump. Um, you know, it's a very tribal mo movement. There's, it's very hyper-partisan. You're sort of like in or you're out. You're, an, you know, you're sort of a member of the pure or the impure. And um, this is a movement that put Trump in office. He's delivering to them everything that they asked for. Um, you know, I interviewed a, a biographer of Mike Pence who described Pence as the most powerful theocrat I'm not, I'm not sure exactly if you use Christian nationalist or theocrat. I can't, I can't quite remember, but the, the most powerful theocrat we've ever had in office. Um, and uh, you write about uh, Ra Ralph Dollinger. Let, let, tell us a little bit about Pence's relationship um, and, to, to these folks. And maybe let's go through a couple of these names like Jeffries and Dollinger and uh, the idea that Ralph Reed is still kicking around. Again, I like he is the perfect example, it seems to me, of how and and you tell me if this is correct and maybe it's just my own um my own sort of a shift in perspective but it does feel like they are a little bit more subterranean or maybe that's just a function of the press because you know it's it's so it seems so inconsistent to talk about these type of folks with Donald Trump as the president, as opposed to George Bush, who was sort of self-professed. I mean, maybe Donald Trump is self-professed, but I mean, who believes him on this? Um, has there, are they just less public facing in some ways? You know, I think that um, in a way, uh, in plain sight, I mean, conspiracies happen under the darkness with unnamed actors. This is largely happening out in the open. It's not really that they're hiding. It's that most aren't are paying attention. Now, you talked about Ralph Dronger, who is the founder of a group called Capital Ministries that targets political leaders at the highest echelons of power. I mean, Ralph makes his, um, Dronger makes his, uh, his, his Bible studies that he teaches to these political leaders public. You can look them up on his website. And if you look on his website, he's got a list of uh, called capital sponsors and Pence is on that list is a number of uh, other, oh, like a dozen current and former members of Trump's cabinet. They're listed as cabinet sponsors on Drollinger's website, which anyone can see. They've attended his weekly Bible study in the nation's capital. Drollinger also has Bible study groups targeting the House of Representatives and the Senate and various state houses. And he is conducting a form of shadow diplomacy with political leaders around the world. So I would say that he's one of the most politically influential pastors in America. And again, his expansive positions on domestic, economic, and foreign policy hits home the fact that Christian nationalism is a political movement, not merely a stance in the so-called culture war, not a religion. But of course, he uses the rhetoric of religion to justify his positions. He promotes the idea that social welfare programs have no basis in scripture He's against progressive income taxes. And he has a theology of taxation that unabashedly favors the rich. So, um, you know, again, this is all music to the ears of the movement's plutocratic funders. Uh, and you mentioned a number of other really intriguing characters. Ralph Reed is one. Um, you know, a lot of the research I did involved going to road to majority conferences and which is I mean, Ralph Reed is sort of the head of that and Valley's Voter Summit and Marches for Life and other types of events. And Ralph Reed is a very savvy political leader. Uh, I remember in advance of the 2016 elections, he talked about the resources he was going to, his group, which is only one group out of many, was going to bring to bear on the 2016 election. And it was like, targeting you know huge amounts of money swing districts 
and it was all focused on getting out the vote among um, sympathetic voters. You know, it wasn't really about winning over voters that were going to sort of, um, you know, had already declared as as Democrats. It was really about the, this is where we're going to go. We're going to knock door to door. We're going to text people. We're going to send all these messages to them. And they were going to, you know, if they haven't voted by 4 p.m., we're going to drive to their house and take them to their polling spots. So it's, it's really a, there's a really well-oiled sort of get out vote machine among this movement. The movement isn't, you know, it's got a number of leaders, but it, the leaders are almost less important than the organizations. Um, the movement consists of this dense ecosystem of for-profit and non-profit groups, right-wing policy groups, legal advocacy organizations, data initiatives. They've really mastered the data piece of this and media and networking organizations. So, you know, I really tried to lay out as much of this ecosystem as I could in my book. The important thing to understand about it is not its um, diversity as much of its um, source of unity, which is a common political vision. And, and I want to talk about that because you do you and I'm, I'm really interested in talking a little bit about the data miners and the attorneys uh, on this. Um, but Ralph Reed is a perfect example, it seems to me, of, uh, of a guy who used to be on television all the time. I met him once. I was at a um, like a CNN uh, like uh, like a house party, like a Christmas event. And I have to say, he was one of the most terrifying people I've ever met. I mean, he was perfectly nice. <laughs> he was perfectly nice. Um, but it, I, 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 it was I, I, he was like an animatron. Uh, I mean, he was very, very strange. He, and um, he's very clever. Very clever. He had this quote, I'm probably going to flub it a little bit. I'm going to paraphrase. He said something like, don't pay attention to the polls. It doesn't matter what percentage of the population we have. That percentage is declining. All that matters is who turns out to vote on election day. So he knows that, um, he also spoke about gerrymandering and voter suppression is what he called the Republican reapportionment advantage. Like just very blithely, you know, he said, well, if the if the vote if the split of support is 50-50, Republicans win. You know, if the split of, is like six to eight, it's you know a Democratic favor, Trump ball. And if it's eight and above, Democrats win. So he really it really understands the consequences of voter suppression and gerrymandering, often race based. And he's pretty matter of fact about that. Look, it, look in a in a country where 40 to 50 percent of people don't bother to turn out to vote or who vote third party, you don't really need a majority of the population to win elections. All you know, need is like a really dedicated and organized and activated minority. The, uh, this movement is a minority of the population, but they're winning elections precisely because they, they're so coherent and networked and they understand, this is really key, they understand the value of unity when necessary. They're, you know, a lot of them, Trump wasn't his, First, their first choices, but I heard at one of Ralph Reed's uh, gatherings, I heard this one uh, leader stand up and say, this election is about judges, judges, judges. And so people, you know, there are many folks who liked Trump for a variety of you know, reasons in that movement, and others were not too fond of him, but they held their noses and voted for him because they knew that when they voted him in office, he was going to nominate the judges that were favorable to their interests. I mean, they're and and they're they're religious zealots. I mean, it's you know, that's almost like written into the definition, right, of, of folks like this. I mean, there's a zealotry, and there is a um, a willingness or a predisposition, uh, almost definitionally, I think, to voices of authority. Right. I mean, that's what it is, it is a, to be it is a much more authoritarian. It emphasizes is like a kind of biblical literalism, uh, the idea that hierarchies are ordained by God um, and uh, should be, you know, um, and that, that I, you know, our laws should be based on the Bible. Really, um, they don't really seem to have uh, much respect for m many of our most cherished constitutional principles as they were written. Um, but let's not forget that there's, you know, people often describe the movement as evangelical, and it does include many evangelicals, but it excludes many evangelicals too. 
and I think most American Christians, and it also um, includes representatives of a variety of Protestant and non-Protestant religion. I mean, I think most American Christians reject the values of conquest and domination that the movement represents. And they too are very passionate about the Bible. They just have a different reading of it. But Christian nationalists reserve some of the most poisonous words for those who identify in, as a Christians of a different sort. There is a large movement of evangelicals who are really trying to uh, you know, question whether this movement is authentically Christian in the first place. I mean, just to get back to, uh, I just want to touch on this, and then I want to move into to 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 another area. Um, but and and I don't mean to to focus so much time on Ralph Reed, but he just seems to be an, an example of what I'm talking about. Ten years ago, fifteen years ago, guys like Ralph Reed, guys like Pat Robertson, guys like uh, Jerry Falwell, they were on TV as much as possible. It seems to me, or at least you know, mainstream cable television. Are, do they feel that they don't have to do that anymore? Not those guys, obviously, but, but, but Ralph Reed is one of them. Do they feel like they don't need to do that anymore because they have their own networks that are sufficient in reaching their people? I mean, what, like, why don't we, I mean, that's what I mean by flying under the radar. Not that they're being, not that they're hiding. It's just that they're not getting out there in front of the cameras, it seems to me, in a way that they used to. Oh, they're just getting out in front of different cameras. Okay. I mean, we can't discount the effect of the right-wing propaganda sphere in growing this movement. Um, if, I mean, uh, Tony Perkins is, I think it's daily now, he does something called Washington Watch. It's uh, listened to widely. Uh, if you look at Focus on the Family, they do media programming. I think they've got something like 80, like some huge number, like millions and millions, tens of millions of of, uh, of subscribers or places where those prog that programming is aired. There's just this really comprehensive right-wing media sphere that um, I spent a lot of time on when I was writing my book. And uh, it's astonishing. You can hear a lot of stuff that will sort of um, help you understand why someone like Trump won in 2016 and why um, he really does present a formidable challenge in 2020. Um, let's. I, I remember one of those, I'm sorry, again, one of Ralph Reed's events, I just want to bring this up, a, a Road to Majority conference I heard, I think it was George Barna or somebody like, George Barna's a right-wing evangelical pollster, and he's uh, sort of been in deep with some of these uh, leading organizations, and he said something like, we want to make it so that our people, meaning the sort of folks who followed this movement and turned out their support for the these hyper conservative uh, Republican candidates, he said, we want to make it so that they don't have to watch CNN or MSNBC or any of this other, they call it, you know, fake news media, <laughs> anything fact checkable, I suppose. And he said, we're working on that. You know, we have our own networks that we're developing. And there are always now new initiatives new, uh, you know, Facebook sites or various types of platforms. It's not just limited to Fox and Breitbart. Uh, and there's just a whole lot of other uh, platforms out there where that type of propaganda gets spread. I think, I think, I think, you know, that must be a, a big part of it because I, it seems to me that like every other day, you know, even like 10 years ago, I would read something about answers in Genesis, or I would read about, uh, you know, uh, Perkins and, focus on the family and, um, uh, you know, the, 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 um, you know, one initiative or another, and they seem to, and maybe it's just, there's less reporters. Uh, it's, it's fallen out of fashion in the mainstream, but it's obviously uh, been just as vibrant. I want to talk just, I want to touch just a little bit on the Federalist Society and their role in this, because, um, I think many people just perceive the Federalist Society as just being conservative in terms of like the way that they, um, uh, I guess, groom judges, but they are far more tied to the uh, the Christian nationalism, I think, than maybe they have been given credit. And you know, we just had a couple of we had one judge who I know is up for like a like a, I think a circuit appeals uh, job who just wrote a, a ruling just this weekend about. Um, 
uh, dealing with, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, attacking a mayor for, for discouraging drive-in church services and, um, you know, uh, may have even like sort of made up uh, like the idea that there was a ban there as a way of sort of signaling to folks in the Federalist Society and uh, folks who are helping with this nomination process that he's a guy you can count on in these situations. But it, it, it strikes me as fascinating that, you know, a big part of his resume padding would be um, along these religious lines and this whole idea of protecting religious freedom, which is a the, the latest attack on things like the First Amendment, the latest line of attack where Betsy DeVos at the Department of Education is attempting basically to take this public education money and funnel it into parochial schools. Talk about th that aspect of it. Yeah, well, the Federal Society, as you said, and uh, an organization like the Judicial Crisis Network play an outsized role in cultivating and promoting right-wing candidates for judicial appointments. Uh, there was a really fantastic piece, and I wrote about this in my book, um, the amount of money. There's a piece in the Washington Post that sort of lays it out. I referred to that in my book, and I uh, put in some other materials that I had from my own reporting the amounts of money that they spend promoting right-wing candidates for judicial appointments, not just for the Supreme Court, but also federal courts, is astonishing. You'd be shocked. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, you know, some of these federal society adjacent organizations are, are moving like, uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars in order to, uh, many tens of millions of dollars in order to promote judicial appointments you, you you always think of it oh you know the uh, president sort of floats a couple of names and people like them or they don't they do their own research it's not like that so you know i think the a lot of the um strategy of the movement comes from these very well-funded legal advocacy groups like the federal society judicial crisis network and then also from the, the alliance defending freedom which has been described as a legal juggernaut of the christian right um, the leaders of the ADF, or Alliance Defending Freedom, have asserted that our laws should be based on their interpretations of the Bible, you know, rather than on longstanding democratic and constitutional principles. So um, you're right. A lot of this stuff is, um, is coming from these outside legal groups. And in, in terms of the whole, uh, you know, idea of promoting this idea of uh, religious freedom, I mean, you know, it's not just for them about, you know, making it possible for these right wing uh, sort of Christians with a supposedly correct belief to be able to discriminate against others of whom they disapprove. So a lot of the bills that come through the so-called religious freedom bills are called anti-LGBT bills, and they are that too. And this is not to discount the fact that they are, many of them, very homophobic although they're now increasingly being used to discriminate against people of other faiths, people in interfaith families, and the non-religious. But um, I think the, the calls for the so-called religious freedom in the movement are as loud and passionate as they are because they're also grounded in, A, a fear that people, that the movement doesn't want to lose their lucrative tax exemptions, and also, B, because they're trying to access a larger flow of public money. So you mentioned Betsy DeVos. Let's just look at that as an example. Um, religious groups, including schools, already receive significant tax benefits and subsidies in the form of exemptions, vouchers, grants, et cetera. So they get a lot of public money and subsidies to begin with. They don't have to open their books to the government and show how they spend it. So, um, but they're, they really want more. They want even more than they've already got. And, the United States spends um, about $500 million, billion dollars per year on public K-12 through education. Um, religiously motivated voucher activists know if they can capture a portion of that money in the name of so-called religious liberty, then the money is going to flow without end. So they've placed a key court uh, case in front of the Supreme Court involved a school district in Montana, and they're basically trying to get the court to effectively say that denying public money to religious schools 
is a violation of their religious freedom. And if that's the case, then, you know, the government has no choice but to fund religious organizations. And that seems to be what they're after. So they're doing this in a lot of other areas as well, but it's just very stark in the area of public education. Now, let's not forget that Betsy DeVos, her family has sort of been a long time, you know, mega funder of the religious right. Um, they spent, you know, millions of dollars on right-wing policy groups and other, um, you know, leading pastors who've bashed public schools and things like that. So she comes from a kind of history that has always looked askance at best at public education. And when you mentioned, like, you know, under the, you know, that it's not as overt as it used to be, I think in the case of Betsy DeVos, that is a bit true, although if you spend a little bit of time researching her life and the groups that she's been involved with, it's quite clear. But um, she and her husband spoke at a, a gathering, literally called a gathering, where they talked about their involvement in what they call education reform, which is defunding public schools by funding money, funneling money to private religious schools, et cetera. She said, we, you know, something to the effect of we need to not speak too openly about this. They, so they call it as a, a means of advancing God's kingdom. They said it's a way to advance kingdom gain. And when they say kingdom, they're talking about a religious idea of funding, you know, God's kingdom, a sort of Christian nationalist idea of, of religion. And then her husband later said to this meeting, like, you know, we need to be careful about talking too much about these activities. So he was signaling to this group that, you know, we're, we're going to be careful in our public facing messaging about this agenda. I, I, I remember uh, reading about uh, it was an interview that the, the two of them gave together talking about the idea that she didn't have an issue with public education, just public schools, because what she wanted to do was to divert public education to her meant money coming from the public to schools. And I think a lot of her privatization push and charter push is essentially a fig leaf for getting money to parochial schools from, you know, public money, public tax dollars that are ostensibly meant for public education sent to um, a parochial schools. All right. Well, so with all this said, and, you know, there, there was a quote, um, something to the effect, and I can't, uh, I, I can't figure out from my notes who said it, was something like all we need is 10 percent of the uh, of of the population to make a lot of these changes, which is a derivation of of a quote that I've heard from a lot of different people. Maybe it's five percent, seven percent. Sometimes people say, um, but you need 10 percent of highly dedicated people and you have the ability to run the tables, essentially. So with that in mind, what what do we what like? What can we do? You know, during the Obama years, um, at one point, I think he said in a, a fundraiser, you know, these folks are, are, are clutching their guns and God and uh, or religion. And there's an awareness of it. But like, what what can we do in this instance? Well, you know, you're right. Um, the religious nationalists are a minority of our population, but they're overrepresented at the ballot box because they're organized and networked and disciplined. So, I mean, this is, you know, the, the path is clear. It's about organization, networking, unity, and discipline. It's about looking beyond the personalities of the candidates and looking about what judges are they going to appoint? Who are they going to appoint to run foreign policy? Who, gonna, who are they going to run uh, and point to to run the different agencies? How do they stand on some of these issues? Like, um, human rights and equality or the environment or things like that. Or, and, and looking beyond the sort of peccadilloes of the, the leading candidates. It's, uh, the religious right is really good at doing that. And then the unity is, is really key, not just holding yourself accountable to vote, but also holding others accountable to vote and investing in infrastructure where possible, that sort of data, media, and messaging that the right has in, invested in decades. And I don't think, you know, I think the rise of uh, uh, religious nationalism is a cause for concern, but it's not a cause for losing hope at all. I'm seeing much more activism and awareness today than I saw four or five years ago. I think people have sort of woken up a bit. Um, you know, 
religious nationalists are using all those tools of democracy to dismantle democracy and and those same tools can be used by all of us to restore it. Catherine Stewart, uh, the um, book is The Power Worshippers Inside the Dangerous Rise of the Re of Religious Nationalism. We will put a link to that on uh, majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. All right, folks. We're going to take a quick break, head into the uh, fun half of the program. Just a reminder, you can support this program by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you get extra content every day, and you help this show um, stay afloat and thrive. So uh, become a member today if you have the ability to do so. Uh, much appreciated. Also, sign up for the AM Quickie. We, uh, we're hoping to. Um, sell some more advertising against it by this time uh we are we starting to we have the numbers uh but uh advertising is not exactly as um flowing as we had hoped but by all means check it out people are enjoying it every morning it's available six or seven minutes gives you the top headlines of the day and uh you can hear my morning voice half the time the other half of the time, you can hear Lucy Steiner's voice, which sounds uh, good all the time. And uh, don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. I am going through a significant amount of the coffee over the course of uh, the day and the show. Um, fortunately, I got a five-pound bag of the Majority Report blend, justcoffee.coop. <clears throat> Also, uh, tomorrow night, TMBS, check out The Michael Brooks Show, patreon.com slash The Michael Brooks Show, youtube.com, The Michael, uh, excuse me, patreon.com slash TMBS, youtube.com slash The Michael Brooks Show. Also, uh, No McKee Const, you can check out uh, No McKee Show, patreon.com slash the no McKee show and also uh youtube.com no McKee const i saw a uh, cartoon about the way i pronounced that the other day so but i think i got i nailed it i think right now oh so, and uh oh i just saw a video of hers um darn it you know i wanted to to pull it we'll, we'll play it tomorrow but she's doing some great um sort of editorial videos on um, just sort of like the, 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 the really tangible parts of where, uh, of what constitutes um, institutional corruption in the context of the democratic party. I mean, the, you know, a lot of times we're just talking about like, you know, these are just people who are just using these opportunities as a way of making cash and, um, and retaining power. And in this instance, the networks of these people are much smaller and very dislodgeable. Um, very important information. Go check those out. Uh, also, uh, don't forget the Antifada. Patreon.com slash the Antifada. New episodes coming out this week. Matt, what's happening on Literary Hangover? Uh, tonight, I'm going to Twitch stream Doom uh, Eternal and maybe A Plague's Tale, uh, Innocence. So uh, go to patreon.com slash literary hangover. I'm going to post it for everybody, but uh, that's where I'm going to post the link. So uh, tonight it is. Check it out, folks. Patreon.com slash literary hangover. Going to take a quick break. Come back with some phone calls. And uh, you can IM the show via the app at majorityapp.com. Be right back. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> 
Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five eighths, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue if you don't like me. Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It's the fun half, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know about you, but I am uh, I am getting a little bit tired of this social isolation. Isolation. I'm finding it uh, very isolating myself. Um, oh, I, this is what I wanted to say. I want to say this up at the top of the show. We've had um, sound engineers contact the show uh, from time to time, and. Um, and uh, and I and I've I've lost all the emails, but if you are someone who uh, is a sound engineer, here is the question I have for you: When I record the AM quickie, I turn on my uh, Audacity on my machine. That's just what I learned to uh, record. And when I do, I get a hum that comes back through my system. I'm going in through USB cables uh, to. Well, my out is like a um, an Onyx blackjack. My in is a, a RCA digital one because apparently some of these some of these you know things like Skype and whatnot do not accept a uh, uh, like a blackjack or uh, what was that other thing that we had in the office the um, the red thing. What are those red boxes called? Uh, Scarlet. Scarlet. Yeah. Um, that it doesn't. That, so, and when I like literally when I turn it on and hit record, when I, I can turn it, I can, I can pop it up, open the thing. No noise. When I hit record, all of a sudden I get the buzz. So there's some type of electrical thing. What can I do to get rid of that? Send me an email at majority reporters at gmail.com. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, I can't believe they found this guy. Oh, I guess he's on Fox and friends. That makes sense. Bill Bennett. Bill Bennett is back. And this guy knows odds. Bill Bennett. Funny if you uh, remember that he had a big uh, uh, gambling issue uh, back in the day after preaching morality to Americans for a long time. There was also some type of like talk about a scandal with a dominatrix. And of course, I am, um, I am, I mean, I guess you could say I'm pro dominatrix, but I'm really more like agnostic. If you want to, um, you know, I have no problem with any of that. Um, but 
um, I do find it a little hypocritical to be talking about, you know, all sorts of morality and have a gambling problem and, um, you know, uh, paying dominatrix even, or, in, or, I mean, I think you should pay. I'm not saying that the payment is the issue. Um, just saying that I think it's just, you, you know, live and let live bill, but here he is coming in and explaining the, um, the, this is the stupidest take about uh, COVID-19 and those things that have been done to keep our numbers low. Here it is, Bill Bennett, who is now, I don't know what Bill Bennett is doing, is he's just a Fox News contributor. Bill, what are we missing about this virus? We see the numbers, uh, 22,000 dead, how many cases, but you took a step back and what did you find? Yeah, let's take a step back. Uh, The estimates now from the University of Washington, which is the model everybody's been going on, even though it's been wrong most of the time uh, by a lot, overstating it, is now they say 60,000 people will die. 61,000 is what we lost to the flu in 2017 and 2018. The flu. Now, we all regret the loss of uh, 61,000 people, if that's what it turns out to be. I'm going to tell you, I think it's going to be less. And salute all those who are working on the front lines on this, the hospital workers, the nurses, the doctors, etc., and the generosity of the American people. But if you look at those numbers and see the comparable, uh, we're going to have fewer fatalities from this than from the flu. For this, we scared the hell out of the American people. We lost 17 million jobs. We put a major dent in the economy. We closed down the schools. You heard Dr. Oz say we probably didn't have to do that. Uh, Shut down the churches and so on. Um, You know, uh, this was not and is not a pandemic, but we do have panic and pandemonium as a result of the hype of this. And it's really unfortunate. Look at the facts. Well, it's a you, it is labeled a pandemic. Pause it for one but second. Uh, it, yeah, right. Uh, it is labeled a pandemic. It's a pandemic. A couple of things that people should keep in mind. There's flu vaccines, which keep 50 percent at worst, generally, the people who get them from getting contracting the flu. Every year, we also have a healthcare system that has basically flu cases built into the system, baked into the system, so we can handle that. In New York, we missed the ICU threshold up to this point by literally, I don't know, a couple of dozen beds. But those beds, the ICU patients are not necessarily distributed on their own in a perfect way so that in any given hospital, we don't surpass that ICU bed threshold. All of this was done with strict stay-at-home orders. All of this is done with social distancing. This is the functional equivalent of saying, why did I need fire insurance this year? My house didn't burn down. The reason why these numbers are down, and yes, it's been two or three months, and we've only had 20,000 deaths only, in quotes, is because of the extraordinary measures that we've taken. If we didn't, we would be talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. I mean, surely these idiots must realize that. Or they just, for some reason, really want to make sure that we don't take this seriously or that it's about the eggheads or the scientists that we can blame. Continue. Uh, you also point out that you believe for, from the number that you're able to see, if you get it, you have a 98 percent chance of survival. Correct. Less than uh, two tenths of one. If you're average American, two tenths of one percent chance that you're going to get it. Two tenths. Uh, and if you get it, you have a 98 percent chance of recovery. These things are very rarely heard uh, out there. As Dr. Oz was just saying, uh, people with the comorbidities uh, who have, you know, heart disease, who have very high blood pressure, who are 75 years old. I'm in my 70s. Uh, these are the real risks. But we have scared the heck out of everybody. And, you know, psychologically, as a people, remember 9-11? We talked about let's roll. In this one, there's been too much. Let's roll up in a ball. Let's hide under the bed. This is not the way America works. Let's get back to work. Bill. Um, let's roll. 
one of the more obnoxious uh, things that came out of 9-11. The, I mean, this is all just sheer stupidity. I want to see William Bennett go into these hospitals and do this report from that hospital. Why doesn't he go into the, why isn't he going into Fox? Go into the studios, bud. I mean, honestly, this is, um, these people, it's like a death cult. And this is the tack they're going to take. Instead of saying we should have had a, um, uh, a federal government that is not dismantling all the plans for something like this, they're just basically saying it's all fake. It's, it's nuts. Let's go to the phones. Call him from an 818 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. What's up? Dave from Jamaica again. Dave from Jamaica. How are you, Dave? I'm doing well. Well, well, it's quarantine. You can do in quarantine. Hey, Matt. I'm Brendan. Um, the, I was going to talk about the religious stuff since you were talking about it with the interview earlier. Um, I don't know if it's my just my personal experience, but I do find I, I, in the left, not that we're supposed to be against religion or for it, but I think it's one of those areas where maybe we should kind of stay away from, as in not get involved too much, because it's kind of hard to tell like when somebody is deeply religious, how easily you can influence them one way or the other, since most of the religious texts are very contradictory. So what's kind of your view on it? It's more like i uh, I'm not sure I am following what you're saying, that, that the left shouldn't um, uh, pay attention to it or... No, not, not necessarily pay attention, but like... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like to get too politically involved in it because it can it's a can of worms or am i still not clear well i i think it is a can of worms and i don't know that necessarily people uh you know that Mm -hmm. that people outside of that world can convince anybody necessarily of of Mm -hmm. you know what's you know someone in that world but i think uh what we can do on the left is be aware that this is a um, a phenomena, and that be aware of what we're up against in terms of you know how organized these people are, and give us a sense of what is the what is behind the you know some of these initiatives. I think that's very important, right? I mean, I look, I yeah. Do I think that I am uh, suited? to go into a, um, uh, this community and convince people like, Hey guys, you know, uh, yeah, that, yeah, I think, I think, I think you're getting to where I'm going to, because like I'm born in Jamaica. Most of the people are super, super religious and I can see the dark sides of it and the light side, because I do think at least with the Bible in general, or maybe with the Torah as well, since it's all Abrahamic stuff, that they, there, you could find left economic strains in there, but I won't deny it because I was kind of forced to study the thing that it's pretty socially conservative down the line. So you might find one or two exceptions, but that's why I'm very wary of it because like I had friends who were normal and they turned into kooks. So I, and then you have other people who turned out just fine. So I don't know. I just said, as an outsider, it's kind of hard to get in there. So, I, I mean, I think that's true. Um, and um, I, I, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you convince those people or that you need to necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they are, are zealots and they are much more, I think, like, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think they're, they're just, highly uh dedicated to what they're doing but i think we should be you know we should be aware of it uh you know i I don't think the idea is that we need to proselytize to these people like hey you you know 
I think the idea is that there's only a certain amount of them and uh, we need to be aware that, you know, the idea of like people, mm -hmm. saying, nobody's going to vote for Donald Trump. These religious folks aren't going to vote for Donald Trump. If you understand that this is very much about uh, maintaining power rather than increasing piety for them mm -hmm. as, as, as organizations, then making mm -hmm. that assessment about whether they'll vote for Donald Trump becomes a lot clearer. Right. I think like the best pitch you can do is like with the material stuff, like you speak to that type of thing, but like to get involved, like, Hey, this is what Jesus would be for is a, a very, very tricky road to go down, at least from my personal. Yeah. Experience. I don't, like, I don't quite <laughs> get how people have arguments mm -hmm. like, you know, scripture says this or scripture says that and expects to sort of like, um, I mean, particularly within the context of Christianity, like, like Judaism, it is all argument based. A lot of this is like just interpreted and, um, it is, you know, the, the religion itself is not based on faith. It is, um, it is based on, you know, action in many respects. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so, but within the context of Christianity where faith is the measure, I don't, I don't quite get, I don't frankly quite get it in any context, but particularly in the context of, you know, but I'm certainly not suited to say, but Jesus said this or that, or trying to rationalize, you know, the Bible in some fashion, because I think it's a story. And, um, right. and no, so I meant when I was younger, yeah, when I was younger to try that, and I do realize that, for a lot of people, they don't even follow it that deeply. It's more of a social gathering type situation. Yes. So, I think it's like it's about it's about belonging to a group and getting power from that group and people exploiting uh, the, those uh, those sentiments. I mean, I think a lot of it is particularly when we're talking about this narrow section, not necessarily all religious people, not necessarily all Christians, hashtag not all Christians, whatever. We're talking about a specific um, subset of these people who are particularly authoritarian, and there's really not much you can do about it, frankly, except for beat them. Appreciate the call, mm -hmm. Dave. Right, yeah. Thanks. Later. Bye. Calling from a 734 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? No way, man. Really? Me? Seriously. Ha, 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 ha. How's it going, Sam? Good. Who's this? Uh, so my name is Matthew Riley. Matthew, are you calling from uh, Michigan? Yes, I am, sir. Um, you guys are getting the brunt of it right now, right? Pardon me? It's getting a little hairy there for you. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually very fortunate to be located where I am in the northern part of the Mitten. And we just got our first case two days ago in our county. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm just super fortunate to be where I am, man. So yeah, I'm just bunkered up here and listening to the tunes, hitting putts, and just getting wasted, dude. Great. Wasted. <laughs> How about you, man? Um, not so much. I got to do the show. Oh yeah, I got the job. All right, I forgot about that. So check this out, man. I got my uh, grandfather. He's ninety three years old. He's ninety three years old, dude. And he grew up up here in the middle of nowhere, you know, so lifelong Republican, right? Yeah. And he, and he said something to me about politics last night on the phone. He's in Florida. Okay. And I just, I just, just went off on Trump, dude. Dude, Trump. Yeah. Trump turned out, he turned down tests from South Korea, right? As soon as we got our first case. Am I wrong? Um, he turned, he turned down, down, he turned down tests from Germany that, uh, came through the, uh, world uh, health organization. All right, man. Yeah, I mean, it was just, uh, I don't know. It was good to like, uh, you know, kind of make my grandfather at 93, a little bit woke, you know? Yeah. Cause he, 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 he got it. You know what I mean? He got it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's real now. It's real. Oh, it's going to get Man, you were talking about earlier, you're talking about like 80,000, 90,000, weren't you? Yeah. <sighs> Come on. Come on, man. 
Okay. I know you're trying to be optimistic, dude, but look, we don't know. We don't know. It really is a function of, well, yeah, I, it's really ultimately a function of, of how cohesive we can stay as a society. It is very conceivable to me that Donald Trump is one day going to arbitrarily in the metrics of his brain go, okay, we're open for business. And then a couple of Republican uh, Senate uh, governors say we're open for business. And then things are going to get a little bit ugly. Um, yes. We shall see though, but uh, Matthew, uh, take care. Uh, good luck uh, in your project. I hope it, uh, hope it goes well, but good luck with the grandpa. Thank you. Thanks, man. All right. See you, man. Bye-bye. I, I'm not going to lie. There is definitely a part of me that uh, wishes that I could be spending this time like Matthew um, in Michigan. I'm, I'm not going to lie. That uh, there is an allure. I know. I know. I, I know. I definitely have a sense that uh, Matt, don't you feel like you could like this could like you're, you're sort of like torn between this idea of like, well, I got to work, but also the idea that I could stay in and just play, you know, do maternal, do maternal, <laughs> uh, just get the pot deliveries and, you know, oh, uh, well, I mean, you know, that's if only there was a way we couldn't do the show. Like it was just completely out of our hands. Can't do it. I can't do it. Can't do it. Um, here is Charlie Kirk. I mean, you know, I like I know what Charlie Kirk is gonna say in this situation, right? Of course. But they are all circling the wagons, trying to make it like somehow Donald Trump is having to fight off the deep state. The deep state so badly wants to get rid of Donald Trump that they are basically creating. I mean, they, they, they haven't. This is third wave coronavirus is a hoax ism. Maybe second wave, right? First, it was just a democratic hoax. We don't need to do anything about it. And now it's like, ugh, not that many people are dying. And so clearly a hoax. We didn't have to do any of this stuff. Here is Charlie Kirk um, carrying that baton. Um, I would say that, wouldn't I? I want to know what our friends uh, think of that. And I want to get their comment on the actual uh, plans that seem to be the focus of the conversation right now. Charlie, let's start with you. I think of you as someone who's really keyed in to the president's base and his supporters and his movement. Let's take the plan that seems to be the one that Dr. Fauci is pushing uh, very hard, which is this notion of virus testing and then identifying, isolating and contact tracing everyone who's got the virus. It sounds like that could be millions and millions of people. How's that going to go down with the Trump base in your view? Yeah, respectfully to Dr. Fauci, I don't think that's I don't think that's going to work. I mean, look, here, here's the thing. The, if you had a ranking anxiety, especially among the Trump base, the people that I communicate with every single day, the thousands and thousands of young people and patriots across the country, what they're most worried about, Steve, is not being able to go back to work. It's the people that are being furloughed. It's the businesses that are being shuttered. It's the anxiety of will life ever return to normal? Now, I'm not minimizing the virus at all. And that, that's nowhere where I'm getting near. Right. But I, I don't think when Dr. Fauci says that we might have to be shut down for a couple more months, that's not going to be politically palatable, as respectful as I possibly can be. And there has to be another way. And that's why your entrepreneurial approach tonight, Steve, deserves to be commended. And we need more solutions that focus on creativity and local control, not national bureaucracy and draconian stay at home measures. Um, this guy, Steve Hahn, is a lunatic, but politically palatable with his base. Are there a lot of people out there going like, I really, really love this idea of staying at home. It's simply a medical necessity. And here's the thing about a pandemic. You can do local control, but be prepared for your people not to be able to leave that locality. Like we're going to have to start. I mean, this is what I was just saying uh, to the last caller. This idea 
And, the, and, and I think you can start to see they're moving in this way. They're trying to lay the groundwork that this is all a bit of a hoax. Because he's saying he's not minimizing uh, the coronavirus. But if you start to say the methodology that everyone agrees upon in terms of containing it, of mitigating it, it's just not palatable. I don't know what that means, really, in this context. And we should delegate that authority to highly localized areas. Maybe he's just talking about governors. What they're setting up is Donald Trump coming out. My guess would be in the next four weeks. Maybe it's by mid-May, maybe early May, maybe even late May, but I imagine before then, coming out and saying, we're in the clear. New York has uh, leveled off. We flattened the curve not understanding that that means it's an ongoing problem. And then you're going to see, I don't know, Texas, maybe you'll see Florida, maybe you'll see maybe Georgia. I don't know what other states essentially relax all of their uh, stay-at-home measures. And it's going to create a tremendous amount of tension. Uh, with states that are trying to maintain it. Who knows that maybe they, they rekindle an outbreak in these localities, in these states. Um, the federal government has been commandeering supplies from states. Maybe they're stockpiling it to give to these states that, um, that open up and continue to spread the virus. I mean, we're going to be dealing with a lot of these issues going forward. We're going to be dealing with them in the context of these states. If the federal government and, you know, look, Donald Trump two months ago could have used uh, the, the uh, Defense Production Act to say, I want you working on swabs because I don't want to run out of swabs. I want you working on, and there's people working on uh, testing for sure, but I want you to work on this testing, even if you're working on other projects. And I want the price to be reasonable. There's a whole host of things he could have been doing, but the Chamber of Commerce didn't want him to. But at one point, we're going to get tests. And then there's going to be all this new set of tensions between people who have been shown to have the antibodies and those who don't. And it's going to start getting really weird. And by weird, I don't mean like weird in a good way. Desperate koala on the IM. I don't care what people are saying about it. Personally, I like your AM quickie SoCal voice. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, best when left. As an older millennial, I'm having the hardest time keeping hope for the future of this country. The show help keeps that go, uh, hope going. Thanks to all of you. Proud to be a member. Thank you, uh, best when left. Audio John, are you using a laptop to record? If so, you can try taking the power adapter out when recording. Often it causes a hum. No, I'm not. Benjamin Dixon, testing. Pay no attention to the mass graves in NYC. The black liberation movement is the answer to white evangelicalism and liberation theology. I mean, uh, this dude is so high. You have to smoke a whole lot to finally be able to do a show high. It takes commitment. Um, is that, is that really Ben? Um, the only time I've ever really done any, uh, performance, um, high was back in my early standup days and in, uh, the, um, catch a rising star, there was a midnight show after we would do like cross comedy or something like that. And, um, on nights that we had done cross comedy, uh, by, by the end of that show, everybody was pretty drunk. And shortly after that show, everybody was pretty high and I would go up and do stand up occasionally high. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to read all of it, Ben. Um, <laughs> Oh, thanks dude. Thank you. Um, and I would attempt to do stand up 
And uh, one night I, I smoked uh, some pot and did some stand up. And occasionally I could get away with doing that. But uh, then Cross, who was, I must have been wasted. And I asked him about this recently. He didn't remember it. L- physically came up and tackled me on stage just to mess with me. I mean, there wasn't that many people there. There's probably 10, 15 people, audience members in the audience. But um, it, was, uh, it was an experience. Uh, Ryan Cole, if somehow I ever end up on a TV panel with Bill Bennett, my plan is to begin every sentence I say in response to him with, I'll wage you, Bill. <laughs> well, Bill, I'll bet you that. That's a good one. A square. Sam, just when we think this madman and his minions can't go lower, the number of lies list lost means not much. And now since the stats show what we suspected, black and brown people more affected, well, a twofer. But nothing should surprise us from these inhumans in the White House. Very spirited and good discussion last Wednesday with uh, Noma Key, Mike, and Jamie. Yeah, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, we're, uh, we got to figure out a way to get uh, um, uh, organize this stuff. Um, going. Uh, Let's get to the phones. Calling from an 861 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Sorry, is this me? Yes, I'm sorry. It is you. Wow. Holy heck. Uh, my name's Tim. I've been featured on the David Feldman show. I'm calling from China right now. Wow. All right. Uh, congratulations on both accords. Yeah. How about that? Um, so I... I've kind of been wondering how much um, of this virus would you say is blamed on, uh, hold on, let me get the pronunciation right, China. How much would you blame this virus on China? How much would I blame it on China? You mean like- No, sorry, China. Well, You gotta say it right, Sam. China. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what you mean because like, uh, because of open air markets? Uh, well, the handling of it more or less, I mean, the markets are what they are. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, I am not terribly surprised that <clears throat> they may not have been, um, forthcoming early on. There was a reason why we had CDC re- representatives working there. Um, and um, there's a reason why we have intelligence agencies that look into stuff like this and give reports to people in Washington. Um, you know, China is what it is. And we, you know, I could, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, May, uh, the 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 list of things to blame that we have no control over is large you know like darn it bats why would you have all these different viruses that uh we don't know about or that we haven't experienced uh darn it um you know uh climate change is something that we could impl- you know we could actually impact but uh, it's it's here to the extent that we may have you know bats and whatnot you know getting closer to populations and 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 and, and viruses being able to exist that couldn't exist before. I don't know if that's directly related, but certainly there are people who think it is. But uh, we can't control China. All that we can do, we can try and influence them. But all we can do no, is for sure. Let me let me just preface my argument with uh, what's going on in the U.S. How much of the outbreak in the U.S. could be blamed on China. Well, I mean, the most of the outbreak in the United States, as far as I know, has come from either, uh, you know, one person, I think, in uh, Westchester from Iran. Uh, there were people who went to a farm, uh, you know, some type of uh, a drug uh, conference in Europe. A lot of it in this country is, you know, in terms of like direct contact, it comes from Europeans. Right, right, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm kind of wondering about that argument about y- you know how how culpable China is in this uh, 
in this outbreak that's going on but, in the U.S. that's killing look, I, look, one I don't American think every because it came from seconds. Europe, because you know people came from Europe. I don't blame Europe either. I mean, because it probably the the Europeans probably got it ultimately from China. It started in China, but the bottom line is, we can only control those things that we can control. And what we can control yeah. in this country is we had the ability to have CDC personnel in China basically monitoring this stuff, but Donald Trump fired them months ago. Right. He wasn't we had, there. Yeah. We, we, had, yeah. we had people who sat on the National Security Council and sat at the Department of Homeland Security who would coordinate things about pandemics. We had a whole system an early warning system built up to deal with this stuff and it was dismantled. So like, exactly. you know, I, I, you know, I, I to blame China, I don't know, uh, blame God. Why did God create <laughs> coronavirus? Well, I, I don't have a, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel you on that. All right. Sure. Well, I appreciate the call, Tim. Say hi to uh, David Feldman. Cause I'm, right. I'm never, talking to him again. Never. Calling from a 612 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Bullprog. Bullprog, how are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, so yeah, while I was sitting on the line kind of gathering my thoughts, I kind of realized this might be a little too after the fact and a little bit of a pipe dream, but um, I think uh, Democrats would do themselves a favor by instead of like releasing dirt on each other to maybe openly discuss the dirt because Republicans are going to talk about it either way. And I don't know, maybe <sighs> they, they do all sorts of dirty stuff, but I'm thinking of like Trump specifically, like say, uh, Warren was the nominee and she tried to hit him with sexism or something and he comes back with oh well you tried to paint poor crazy Bernie as a sexist so maybe you're not such a great judge of that and or like hit Bernie but with be, be, but, but be, you kiss up to dictators be, like more, be more specific as to what you're talking about right now because I'm not really sure I f follow you, I feel like you're talking hypotheticals. Like specifically, what are you talking about? Well, I was trying to avoid bringing up Biden dirt uh, just because. Well, I mean, the New York Times ugly. has at the very least done some reporting on this. And so, and, you know, someone has filed a criminal complaint, uh, Tara Reid. You know, we mentioned it on this program, I guess, about two weeks ago when uh, the interview came out and that story in The Intercept. Um you know, look, there's, um, it's very, obviously, I don't think there's going to be any criminal charges, but I mean, to go to the police uh, is a, with, with charges and file a fake uh, complaint is, you know, is illegal. So there's some stakes involved in it uh, for her. I don't know. We're never going to find the, uh, the truth about it, to be honest with you. Um, you know, there's a couple of things in the story that strike me as, um, you know, not like I say, none of this is conclusive, but it's troubling. Like the, uh, there were contemporaneous, there are people who presumably the police will talk to them. These other witnesses, or I should say, uh, not witnesses, but people who she, um, told contemporaneously one is a friend who's remained anonymous. Uh, one was a friend in 2008 that she told, she told her brother also subsequent to that moment, or maybe during that time, he didn't necessarily, uh, maybe not the full extent of it, but something to that effect. Um, he is not talking to the media anymore, but presumably he'll end up talking to, uh, the police if they investigate this. The only other thing that strikes out of me is that, uh, she claims that she was basically relieved of her duties after she reported this um, in overseeing the interns in the office and the interns, they didn't know anything about it, but they did say that she was removed at that time. 
sort of uh, very abruptly, presumably the people working at the office would be able to say, well, she was removed from that because she wasn't doing well or something, or the interns were, you know, partying or whatnot. Uh, but there's no, they haven't said anything like that. So I don't know. Um, and I don't know really, I mean, frankly, beyond that, I don't know that there's much more to discuss about it unless there's more that is developed. We got to wait for this investigation. The times piece uh, was written in a way that I think you would get the sense that the reporters didn't necessarily think that um, the charges were super credible, but you can't tell whether that's because they are skeptical or they have, um, you know, some other biases or there's other stuff that they feel they can't report on because it's not confirmed or whatnot. It's hard to say. It's very difficult to say, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I was thinking of more of like a discussion of gaming out these different paths of dirt, whether it's true or not, because Republicans play dirty and it's going to depend on what sticks to the candidate. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, I personally think that something like this, I mean, just to, to look at it completely in that frame, right. In terms of, from an electability standpoint, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think what it does is it, in some ways, doesn't totally, but in some ways, provides some inoculation um, for Donald Trump in terms of the myriad of accusations against him. But with that said, like everybody knows about it, it was relevant to the extent that it was relevant. Um, I think that the disdain for Donald Trump is such that for people who wanted to vote against him from the get-go and did not care who they were going to vote for, I don't know that it's going to change many minds. I don't know if it's going to change many minds, period. Um, I'm not convinced that the vast majority of people, the vast majority, not all, the vast majority of people who are bringing it up are, you know, sincerely offended by this. I think they're more sort of like, disgusted at what they perceive as his hypocrisy on the part of, you know, unspecified people that it wouldn't make a difference and that they'd be willing to vote for Biden. But I, you know, it's trying there, you know, so I don't know, but, um, it's bad. I mean, Joe Biden has a problem with, at the very least, I think, you know, it's pretty clear he has a problem with sort of feeling like he doesn't have territorial uh, dominion over a lot of the women he comes across. Let's put it that way. I mean, I think that's quite obvious. There has been a myriad of charges about that. It, you know, this charge, according to the, to the, to the Times reporting, is unique in its aggressiveness and you know i mean it's it was a full on sexual assault and they did not come up with anybody who would who um has said that they experienced the same thing now with the with the reporting and it becoming a sort of a broader more mainstream uh report it's not inconceivable that you might start to hear from those people because nobody wants to be the first person, the only person to make that type of charge. So we'll see. Okay. Hey, uh, what, what kind of mic you got there? Is that a SM58? Yes, it is. Oh, sweet. Classic. All right, thanks, Sam. <laughs> thanks, Bullprog. <laughs> Bullprog likes the classic mics. That's the one thing they say about Bullprog. Likes the classic mics. Calling from a 917 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? I may switch the mic. Hello, Mr. Mr. Go ahead. Mr. Cedar, is, uh, is this me? Uh, am I being heard? Mr. You, yes. Uh, what can I do for you? 
What's, oh, what's fantastic. Okay, well, long-time listener, first-time complainer. Um, is it okay if I call you Mr. Cedar? I'd, I'd like to keep things professional and civil here. Well, um, fine. Why don't you uh, tell me your name? Um, well, uh, I'm sorry. You're, you're kind of roboting just a little bit. Can you repeat that? Tell me your name. Okay. Well, I, I, it's, it's so garbled. I, I'm going to try my hardest to understand you, but tell but me your you name. Me, so I'm just going to proceed. Okay. Um, my name is Vadim. I'm calling from an undisclosed location because my client creationist cat doesn't want to divulge his whereabouts. Uh, I believe you're familiar with this cat. Creationist cat. I've heard of him. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, I'm glad you at least admit that. Uh, I'm call I've been trying to call for, for some time now, by the way. I, I get the feeling that you guys have been blocking my calls. Probably. So I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that this fluke occurred. Um, but look, I'm calling in because, first of all, on a show that aired, I believe, two Mondays ago, you started by saying that you have a, quote, real problem with Creationist Cat. So much so that you repeated it twice. Your tone was what I would characterize as venomous. You said that you are never going to talk to that guy and that he is despicable. And you said that you think he he knows everything, um, which, you know, he, he wanted me to clarify that he does. And you also said that he's a tough guy. So um, I think I you'll find I said he thinks he's a tough guy. Right. Yes, exactly. He said that, that he thinks he's a tough guy. Right. Um, I just, first of all, first off, um, you know, I, I want to say this is a little odd for me because I, I do enjoy the show. Uh, we're, we're, our, our politics align a little bit more than mine does with Creationist Cat, yet at the same time, he's my cat. And, uh, you know, I just, I don't like hearing him denigrated. So, um, you know, I'm calling in for that reason, but, um, so you're look, saying that you know, you're, I, you're kitty whipped as it were. I, uh, you could say that. I mean, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I he, he, he's a cat. Okay. Um, and right. cats are adorable. It's really difficult to dislike a cat. And, um, I found I it easy you had at really times. Harsh words about him. You know, you, you said that you would never talk to that guy. And I have both email correspondences as well as Twitter DMs stating specifically that you would face off with creationist cat on the glorious battlefield of ideas. So, um, I mean, what are you doing here? Mr. B Mr. Cedar, I mean, are you pulling a crowder on us? Do you, do you, do I, do we have to start a cold feeder cedar hashtag? Cold feeder cedar. Um, well, I'll tell you what. I um, I will talk to Creationist Cat. I will talk probably down to Creationist Cat because um, not just because of a cat's stature in general, but specifically because of my disdain for your cat. So, yes, go back, tell your little master. Uh, I will, uh, I'm willing to to engage with, with, with it. It. Mm. Yeah. It, you, you know, Mr. Cedar, you said this was the fun half. Is this fun to you? Is this your idea of fun? Denigrating a cat? Yeah. Slandering his good character? Yeah. That is fun for me. And it's going to be really fun for me to do it to its whiskers. Okay. All right, Sam. Um, Look, you know, uh, in in a, in a previous episode, you said that you would also that you would uh, uh, face off with him, but you said that you needed a dander shot first. Have you got your dander shot? My what? Dander. That, what? That's how you referred it. Refer to it. You someone called in and said that they would uh, that they wanted to see you debate creationist cat, and you said that you had to get your dander shot first. <laughs> Well, now that I am in a, uh, a a remote location from your cat, I could probably get away without the dander shot. I probably have built a uh, built up my own dander tolerance. I look—I'm not afraid of your cat. Let me put it that way. 
So you can start any you sound cold pretty feed. Afraid. I'm you not can afraid any cold feed terrified. cedar um, uh, thing you want to. I'm not afraid of that cat. I'm willing to talk to I that cat. It, 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 this, this, this all sounds like pure deflection. This all sounds like, and, and I'm a fan of yours, by the way. You know, I mean, I, again, I'm here representing creationist cat, so I have to kind of, uh, you, you know, convey his message. Well, I don't but care. As, as someone Bring it. who admires Here's my work, message. I just, Bring I, it. I hear Bring it. fear within your voice. Right. Okay. Bring it. That's all I'm saying. Have have your your cat's other representatives contact me because I'm done talking to you. All right, all right, okay, right. We'll, we'll see you on the battlefield of ideas. Right, get ready to uh, get decimated, Mister Cedar. Later. Sure. Okay. Watch out, everybody. Oh, I'm a cat. I'm not afraid of that cat. I'm not afraid of it all. Cat's a joke, as far as I'm concerned. Here is um, Anthony Fauci on with Jake Tapper. When we hear that Donald Trump is uh, spending Easter weekend asking around, like, well, what do you think about this Fauci guy? Should I be, should I get rid of him? Is he undercutting me? <laughs> Even as he is... Um, helping with the medical health of the country? Well, here's a big part of the reason, because uh, Fauci, he let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. The New York Times reported yesterday that, that you and other top officials wanted to recommend social and physical distancing guidelines to President Trump as far back as the third week of February, uh, but the uh, administration didn't announce such guidelines to the American public until March 16th, almost a month later. Why? You know, Jake, as I've said many times, we look at it from a pure health standpoint. We make a recommendation. Often the recommendation is taken. Sometimes it's not. But we, it is what it is. We are where we are right now. Do you think lives could have been saved uh, if social distancing, physical distancing, stay-at-home measures had started third week of February instead of mid-March? You know, Jake, again, it's the what would have, what could have. It's very difficult to, to go back and say that. I mean, obviously, you could logically say that if you had a process that was ongoing and you started mitigation earlier, you could have saved lives. Obviously, no one is going to deny that. But what goes into those kinds of decisions is, is complicated. But you're right. I mean, obviously, if we had right from the very beginning shut everything down, it may have been a little bit different. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then. I mean, Fauci is in a tough position here um, insofar as I think he realizes that if he gets fired by Donald Trump, and that's a, always, I got to imagine, if you're working for him, a real possibility that some lunatic could be brought in who just simply, and, you know, when Redfield was the sort of the, the lead on this from the CDC, uh, he is a guy who was on the, um, you know, was working on AIDS back in the day and, you know, thought like, uh, I don't know, if you spray some type of religious, uh, you know, concoction on people, maybe uh, they won't get AIDS. And I can imagine from Fauci's perspective, he's looking around and saying, if I get uh, fired, the person who replaces me could end up basically being a patsy for these voices in the White House that only care about what the president's reelection numbers look like and are willing to take a risk that tens of thousands or more people could die to see if Donald Trump can get, you know, some of his electoral mojo back. And so he's on there trying to be circumspect. And uh, however, he's also a scientist and he's asked like a very basic question. And it's very difficult for him, I think, to just completely lie about it. So he's just there basically saying, well, obviously, you know, and, and if he was more of a politician, he could have said something to the effect of like, well, 
you know, Jake, everything is always a trade-off and, um, you know, uh, I, uh, my job is to just always make, uh, the medical recommendation and not to assess, um, you know, what the trade-off is going to be. And, uh, but, um, I don't want to say that there's anybody in the white house who is willing to have uh, an extra 10, 30, 40, 50,000 deaths or, but you know, the bottom line is this, um, had we started this earlier, the ability to keep it in check would have been that much greater. The earlier you start on something, um, the better it is. And uh, guys like Cuomo and de Blasio, to some extent, uh, deserve criticism for not closing down New York City early enough. But in part, that's a function of the federal government not providing any type of 30,000 foot explanation. It would have been much harder for them to do this if, um, if the federal government is out there, uh, if the federal government is out there, you know, saying uh, there's no big, no big deal. We got that call uh, from someone who was saying, that, you know, how much do I blame China, which uh, for this. Here is uh, Marsha Blackburn, and apparently there's some concern in Democratic circles that there is that this uh, blame China thing uh, is part of a larger project to blame Joe Biden. I don't, I'm not quite sure I, I fully get that uh, that connection. I think there's um, plenty of problems with Joe Biden at this point. I don't know if China is one of them. And again, this all seems to be mitigation of loss on their side. We're not at the point in the election where we start to see them attempt to focus on keeping voters from coming out for Joe Biden. Um, But here is Marsha Blackburn uh, from Tennessee. Really making well, it clear one, that China is the problem. Well, one of the things I think should happen with uh, the UN Human Rights Council and the WHO, my goodness, here we have China being protected by the WHO, and then they're wanting to have this seat on the UN Human Rights Council. Maybe it's time to review the funding that we send to them. Maybe it is time to send that message that what China did, listen, China is not our friend. They are our enemy. They have been ripping us off, taking our jobs. They have been sending us this virus this year. They've been stealing our intellectual property. And we need to realize they are not our friend. They are part of the new axis of evil. You've got North Korea and China and Iran and Russia. And judge, these are not people who wish us well. And when you see what China has done, not only to us, but to the entire globe with this pandemic. Well, one of the things. You know, it's strange. There's a story in Politico that talks about, and we just uh, obviously uh, did an interview with Catherine Stewart about these folks, that the uh, evangelical right, or she would say the Christian nationalists, um, are really pushing this line about uh, attacking China. And it is sort of dovetailing a little bit with, uh, you know, Josh Hawley and this sort of um, America first manufacturing populism. And they're conflating a lot of things that I think, you know, both the xenophobia and also how messed up our supply lines are and how messed up our industrial policy is and how messed up our economy is. And that may be effective because the Democrats 
at least uh, you know our 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 presumptive presidential nominee is not offering anything to compete with it. Now it may work. It may work. They can. It it may be the case that this ends up being just a referendum on Donald Trump. That Donald Trump is so atrocious that we will have record voting like we did in 2018. But it also may be the case that he stumbles across one of these uh, talking points. He says, I'm going to expand, you know, uh, Joe Biden says Medicare at age 60. I'm going to do Medicare at age 55. I'm going to do Medicare at age 50. He doesn't even have to do it. He can just say it. And he can put some type of provision in there that's basically some type of poison pill and it doesn't happen. We're just talking, you know, purely from a rhetorical standpoint, there needs to be a response to this type of stuff. There needs to be something to fill that vacuum. That's my opinion. Now, maybe the strategy of literally, you know, a can of soup, but if they start being able to make it about issues, if they start being able to say, oh, incidentally, that can of soup, it's radioactive. I wouldn't open it. Oh, that can of soup, it's leaking. We're in trouble. So I don't know. This is the strategy. Um, obviously, Biden is the presumptive nominee, but I hope somebody tells him like this strategy is maybe not necessarily the safest one to pursue because you can't start sometime in September or October with some type of plan, some type of real vision. Can't pivot from, I'm just the guy you're never going to hear about. I'm just a guy who's going to bring everything back to normal in some way. You, you know, you'll think about the president once every couple of months. And then in October, September, make the pitch like, but I'm going to do this stuff for you. The ship will have sailed at that point. Here is um, Greg Gutfield. Is he still, what's he doing? Is he on the five? What, what are they doing for that five, Brendan? I would imagine that they're uh, all in different locations, I think. I'm not watching the five. Right? You're not? No, I watched the five a few years ago, and I think they've got bad. the The cast is is crap. It's like SNL, right? Yeah, you know, if it's not a good cast, what are you going doing? Going through a bad period. Mm -hmm. Well, here's Greg uh, Greg Gutfield from the five. I guess we're going to see, and this is his take on um, on the campaign strategy um, that he has in the wake of uh, COVID nineteen. Trump has a great opportunity to like look at Joe Biden every time Joe Biden adopts a Bernie Sanders idea, like the green, let's say he, the Green yeah. New Deal. He, all he has to say, all Trump has to say is, "Do you remember March and, eight, uh, and April 2020 when you you had bread lines and empty shelves and and the supermarket was like the DMV? That's socialism. That's what you're voting for. I think that yeah. is a good ploy." Yeah. So let me get this straight. Socialism is going to look like capitalism in dealing with this uh, COVID-19. Let's just basically just like take something that is horrible as a function. And, and, and much of what we're dealing with is a function of, of capitalism in this country, particularly as it has been practiced. With, with very little restraints. Restraints on how capital can move between this country and other countries. Constraints in terms of uh, just-in-time delivery. I mean, I, the more, you know, I have been um, uh, thinking about what we're facing, the assault that we're hearing from the right on things like insurance, right? That's what this whole stay-at-home policy is about. It's insurance. And when it's effective, they complain about it because it's been effective, which indicates that it was not needed in the first place. 
which is just bizarre. But it's also about externalities. We need to get the economy going. And who's going to pay the price for that? Well, we know who's been paying the price for it right now. It's low-income people. It's black people. It's brown people. Elderly people. Basically, people in uh, you know who have less political power, or have been decided to be disposable or dispensable, and largely, I mean, that is what their their take is going to be. It's going to be we're going to make those people who have the least amount of political power pay the biggest price in this situation. They're going to have to go to work. They're going to have to go to the fast food stores. They're going to have to do the deliveries. While the wealthier people stay at home, do our home from work. And as far as health insurance, I mean, there is a reason why this country is suffering more unemployment than any other country. And it's not because of the stay at home orders. It's because We have a government that is completely reluctant to develop any type of support mechanisms in our society that would mitigate this. I mean, here we're talking about, Donald Trump is talking about uh, um, refusing to bail out the post office. Why is the post office having a problem here? In part because first-class mail is... uh, drying up as a business right now and catalogs and whatnot also somewhat diminishing and deliveries are on the rise and maybe they're not charging enough to Amazon and these companies, but the main drag on the post office has been building since 2006. And I've talked about this many times on the program over the years in 2006, a Republican controlled Congress passed the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, signed into law by George W. Bush. The Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act of 2006 required the post office, the Postal Service, and just to be clear, the Postal Service has never relied on tax dollars or prior to this. 2006, it never relied on tax dollars whatsoever, fully funded by stamps. Now, they don't have the ability to increase the price of stamps without Congress signing off. They have the ability to do really anything without Congress signing off from it. So they're constrained as an operating entity in many, many ways that other companies are not, but they still functioned to provide a service that the market could never and would never provide. There is no way I'm going to start a delivery business that is going to charge the same amount for a first-class letter delivered in a high-density area like New York City and out where, you know, Matt's cousins live in North Dakota. There's no way I'm going to there's no way I'm going to charge 42 cents for both of those activities if I'm the private market. No way. I'm willing to deliver that letter to Matt's cousins for I don't know, 16 bucks. But I ain't going to do it for 42. It's an incredibly not only egalitarian uh, service. But it's a crucial it's a crucial one. Because people out in uh, North Dakota, they're not going to pay 16 bucks for that letter. So you have them fully funded by their own stamps. The Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act uh, is passed. And it forces the Postal Service. And there's no rationale to this because there's not a single company in the country, maybe in the world who has this obligation, there's not a single agency or enterprise in the country, governmental or otherwise, 
that has this obligation. It's completely bizarre. It required the Postal Service to calculate all of its likely pension costs over the next 75 years for workers for the postal office who are still decades out from being born. And then save enough between 2007 and 2016, 2016 to cover most of them. In other words, you've got to pre-fund <clears throat> pension costs for people who are working at your company who are not even born yet, your agency, your, your organization, that are decades away from being born. No one has that obligation. Why did they do this? So that they would weaken the postal office that, so that over time, maybe it would take 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, it would become weak enough that some Republican president down the road could pull the plug on it and just privatize the whole thing. Well, they also got lucky because with this economic and medical shock with coronavirus, now they're in a big hole. And they are looking for a bailout like we gave to the airlines, like we've given to corporate America, like we've given to every aspect of society. But they don't want to do it to the postal office. Now, I suspect that this is um, this is just um, a negotiation by Donald Trump. Postal Service is losing $2 billion a month through the coronavirus recession. They are incredibly crucial right now. Lawmakers already agreed on a $13 billion grant to the Postal Service, for which they would not have to repay. Mnuchin uh, blocked it. So only a $10 billion loan, loan to the Postal Service made it into the um, legislation that passed. But Trump is threatening to veto the CARES Act if it has uh, the postal age, you know, the postal agency getting any money. And um, he is somehow blocking the emergency funding. I think it's, he's full of it. I think this is uh, basically designed to make it look like um, this is going to be a concession he makes to the Democrats. So the Democrats, who have been incredibly weak throughout phase three and are teeing up weakness in phase four, avoiding asking for things like voter protection. All they're doing is asking for stuff that the Trump administration wants to spend money on anyways. If Donald Trump kills the post office, ladies and gentlemen, there will be a revolt in this country like you, would, you, you can't even believe by his own voters. In New York City, we're still going to have some form of delivery. We're so dense. In the Northeast, things are so dense that you could, you could replace the service. It'd be more expensive. You can't send it to uh, everywhere. But places in the Midwest, places in the South, rural areas, Donald Trump is just posturing right now. The Democrats should just say, Donald Trump owns this. He wants to destroy the post office. We will bring it back. Day one, we will build it, but we will bring it back. We will rehire every postal worker there is. He will pay the unemployment for all the postal workers that will go off. And then we will hire every postal worker when he returns. In the meantime, we want voter, uh, voter protections. This is the way the Democrats should be playing this. But they are so afraid. It's not even ideological. 
they're so afraid. It's not even about power. If you wanted to maintain your power to push your neoliberal agenda, then get voters to vote you in. It's just that they are just operating under a completely archaic political perspective. Our leaders are just ossified in their thinking. It's stunning. In fact, not only should Joe Biden say, and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer should say, the post office is on you. It's on the Republicans. We've passed this. We would like to give them a grant. We want to continue the post office. We're going to rehire everybody and we're going to add postal banking. If we had postal banking in this country right now, the ability for the post office to be a mechanism in which to provide emergency funding to Americans could be flicked on like that. Every post office could deliver a card to somebody. But uh, we don't. That's also a failure of Democrats, frankly, at the time. I mean, there, there are all these instruments that don't sound that sexy that can be used in a way to build out all the things you would want from a greater social welfare state. But the Democrats have failed time and time again to implement these things. Sometimes I think it's ideological. Other times I think it's just sheer incompetence, sheer temerity. It's ridiculous. Here's Andrew Cuomo explaining why Bill de Blasio in New York City cannot close schools unilaterally, which seems ridiculous to me. I don't even get his, 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 um, his argument here. which is he thinks schools should be canceled for the rest of the year. Uh, when we made the decision to close the schools, we made it for the entire metropolitan region. Uh, Suffolk, Nassau, New York City, Westchester, Rockland. Uh, you can't make a decision just within New York City without coordinating that decision with the whole metropolitan region because it all works together. So when we decided to close the schools. I spoke to Nassau, I spoke to Suffolk, spoke to New York City, spoke to Westchester, and we closed all the schools at once. Any decision to reopen them will also be a coordinated decision. Uh, the mayor has an opinion on New York City. Laura Curran, county executive of Nassau, will have an opinion on Nassau. Steve Ballone will have an opinion in Suffolk. George Latimer will have an opinion in Westchester, but I want to coordinate all those opinions and reopen them at the same time. I'd also like to ideally coordinate that with Connecticut and New Jersey. So whatever we do, we do all at the same time. So I understand the mayor's position, which is he wants to close them until June. And we may do that, but we're going to do it in a coordinated sense with the other localities. It makes no sense for one locality to take an action that's not coordinated with the others. Is that action invalid? The, the well, that's Arizona? his opinion, but he didn't close them and he can't open them. It happened on a metropolitan-wide basis, and we're going to either, we'll act on a metropolitan basis, coordinated with Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester. And ideally, I'd like to coordinate with New Jersey and Connecticut uh, if we can, the New Jersey and Connecticut coordination is not a legal matter. It's uh, a mutual basis of interest. Legally, I want the metropolitan area coordinated. I don't want Suffolk doing something that Nassau doesn't do, that New York City doesn't do, that Westchester doesn't do. But just to clarify for parents in the New York City metropolitan region who have kids in public schools, should they anticipate them going back to school or is school off? The there has been no decision. That's the mayor's opinion. I value it. I value Laura Kern's opinion, Steve Ballone's opinion, George Latimer's opinion, but the decision will be coordinated among all of them. This guy is such an, a, a, an incredible egomaniacal a-hole. 
First of all, you notice here he said it's not a legal thing uh, in terms of uh, the tri-state area, Connecticut and um, with New Jersey. And then he said, and legally, I want the metropolitan area because there's no law. There's no statutory obligation. Bill de Blasio cancels school in New York City on snow days without coordinating with the metropolitan area. It's absurd. There's no rationale why you would close New York City schools as opposed to schools out in Westchester County. Are you kidding me? My daughter goes to a 4,500 students in her school, in her school. That's bigger than some of these counties' entire education. And, and that's one of, I don't know, hundreds of high schools in New York City. When people go to school in Westchester County, they drive in their car and they take them to school. Maybe they take a bus. In New York City, you've got kids taking the subways. You got the, the idea that these things are in some way tied to each other is absurd. It's absurd. He just wants control over this. This guy's a nut job. A complete nut job in this way. I mean, I, I think I cut him slack, more slack than a lot of uh, people who are read into this in terms of pulling the trigger so late in New York State and New York City because the federal government wasn't providing any guidance. But you start to read into this stuff, and you start to realize this is all about his ego. He wanted to be the guy to cancel school. He wanted to be the guy to issue the stay-at-home order. Really effed up. Really messed up with this guy. Um, oh, my God. Let's talk about Matt Walsh for a moment. Here is uh, Matt Walsh complaining that, I mean, I've heard stories of doctors. I know one guy, he was working at, um, I suppose I could say the hospital, Mount Sinai in New York City. Um, he is a doctor. Has been wor worked 16 days straight. 15 hour days. Come home, strip in the garage, because he doesn't even live in New York City. Strip in the garage, completely wash down everything uh, to come in to see his family. You have nurses doing the same thing. It's brutal, brutal for these people. And the idea that any nurses anywhere would take a moment to try and escape the horror of this is apparently highly problematic for Matt Walsh, who is sitting comfortably in his house shooting videos. Big, big booty, what you got a big booty? Big, big booty, what you got a big booty? What are you doing? Are you getting rid of the audio on there? Oh, here it is. Uh, we were told that we had to willingly plunge ourselves into a Great Depression while hospitals are being overwhelmed. Meanwhile, TikTok is full of videos of hospital, hospital staff performing choreographed dance routines. What a joke. The whole thing infuriating. God forbid. These people who are stuck in there for days on end, just watching people die, take even five to 10 minutes to just like relieve some of the pressure. What a, what a, just a jerk off. What an inhumane a-hole.
It's nuts. One minute, the guy's saying it. Remember, like the last time we heard from Matt Walsh, he was saying it was all a joke anyways. Amazing. Meanwhile, here are the cops. Um, I don't understand what, what's going on, New York City cops here. But play this clip of uh, New York City cops on the subway. This is coming from Saturday. Look at that little boy. That's fucked up. Look at that little boy. That's a little ass boy. That's a little boy. He's trying to sell candy in here. Oh, that's corny as hell, bro. He's trying to sell candy. That's a little boy. That's a little boy, bro. They don't want to be good. But y'all niggas don't do none of that shit. That shit made me want to get off this damn train. That's a little boy. Well, like, y'all don't do that to none of the grown ass niggas that sell candy, though, bro. Man, let them back on the train. That was sell candy. Fuck y'all niggas, man. Out the door, man, to little man get back with his friends. Oh, God. Why you take his jacket off? Yo, look Why are you doing that to him? Bro, we got to get on this train. That shit make me mad. For real. Yo, let that little boy go. Little boy. Look at that shit, yo. Look at that shit. He crying. And that's her son, bro. He's not supposed to be on him like that. Yo, that's fucked up, yo. That's fucked up, yo. That's the little boy. Look how they cheating this little boy, yo. He's supposed to be protecting somebody, bro. That's my son. Yo, it's a whole kid, my nigga. That is my son. That is my son. That is my son. He only got chips and candy, my nigga. You get some chips and candy on the train. That's my son. Let my son go. Let my son go. Let my son go. go. That is my son. That is my son. That is my son. Let my son go. Look at that shit, bro. Let my child go. I'm not. That's a little boy, though. You got right. They not supposed to do that to a little boy. That's a little boy. That's a little boy. Look at him. He's crying. 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 Look at Cause he was selling shit. Selling shit. He was selling shit. 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 You know, you can't let the, I mean, if it's such a health concern, why aren't the cops all wearing masks? It's unbelievable. It's nuts. There's got to be some uh, latitude in this situation. People are broke. People are worrying about having money. It's um, it's bad. All right. Um, one bit of news. Apparently, uh, Bernie Sanders has endorsed Joe Biden and announced a joint task force between Sanders and Biden working on by staffs. Um, Econ uh, and they are dealing with the economy, education, climate change, and criminal justice. So uh, I don't know what that means. That's reported by the New York Times. They're doing a uh, live stream. Did they just do it? All right. Well, we'll play clips of it tomorrow. But that's good. Um, I, I don't know the details, but... Um, the important thing, I think, with Joe Biden is that somebody is there putting ideas in his head because I don't know that there's much that's there, frankly. And uh, access is the important thing. Because I don't feel like this guy has a program other than returning dignity to the White House. And 
The question is, who's going to have the pole position? I'm sure there's going to be a ton of lobbyists, and um, but we'll see. All right, let's take a couple. Of, uh, let's take one more phone call, and then um, and I'll do a couple of IMs, and we'll get out of here, folks. I'm not going to get to all your calls, of course. As we say during this time of year, Manish Tana, Halila Hazah. Calling from a 636 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. This is Patrick from St. Louis. Patrick from St. Louis. What's on your mind? So this is a little off the, uh, off the radar a little bit, um, but I, I've been trying to just see any sort of connective tissue that you can find in any of the statements that are coming from the White House or Washington or private industry or anything like that. And last Saturday, all of the major sports leagues uh, met with the Trump administration in the White House. And one of the partners or one of the people that were there was uh, Vince McMahon. Uh, he's the owner of the WWE, but he's also the owner of the XFL. And what's been really fascinating the past week is since that meeting, you've seen all of these major leagues, for, for lack of a better word, do pretty outlandish things, or at least they're starting to, to float some trial balloons. Uh, you're seeing Major League Baseball talk about changing rules fundamentally, changing divisions, things like that. Uh, you're seeing National Football League talking about moving to a winter league. They're not going to be, you know, potentially not playing in the fall this year. Uh, you know, conspicuous by their absence was college. Um, the, the colleges weren't involved, um, so they're not even entertaining that right now at the White House. Um, and the National Hockey League has also announced uh, that they are going to be talking about extending their um, their their distancing policies uh, after the 15th of this month. So that's probably going to be extended again. Uh, NBA is talking about moving their draft to the uh, to the fall. They don't even have a date right now that they're going to do their draft. Um, but what was really interesting is Friday, out of nowhere, um, the XFL uh, announced that they were just folding. They're just closing up shop. They're, they're no longer going to be um, operating. All of their employees are fired over a Zoom call, uh, including the players. Uh, a lot of the players found out that the league was folding um, on social media, and they were actually pretty successful. Um, so all of this is kind of building to a point. I'm, I'm going to hang up and listen because I know that you've uh, got some abbreviated time. But something tells me that there is information that is coming out of those sort of meetings that because the principals involved are people that President Trump actually respects, <laughs> um, sports, you know, commissioners, things like that, those are, those are people that he actually, you know, considers peers in a way. I'm curious if there is some sort of information that came from those meetings that is not available to the public yet that is showing that there's something we don't know. And I hate to be conspiratorial and I hate to sound like that, but it just seems like a meeting happens on a Saturday and then literally within five working days, the landscape of all of the major sports leagues in the United States are fundamentally changed. I, I mean, I think it's, uh, so I, I, think, to get your I think it's fairly straightforward. I think they were told we're, you know, we're going to try and get things started again, but the idea of getting 20 or 30,000 people into a stadium or 10,000 people into a stadium or 15,000 people into an arena, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen for a long time. And the, you know, the only other question is like, can you do football games? Let's say with just TV revenue, maybe, maybe some, but not, you know, I don't know if there's enough revenue there across the league. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I feel like that was more or less known. Um, I, I don't feel like there was any real groundbreaking information that had come from that. And, uh, I mean, we, they had known for a while that the NHL had been talking about playing in empty arenas for their playoffs. Uh, baseball had been talking about doing it through, you know, part of the summer as well. Uh, just the, it, it seems like that the league's, almost to a, to a letter, all changed their course coming out of that meeting. Um, but I appreciate your insight and uh, thanks for everything you do. All right. I appreciate the call. I don't know. Maybe there's something more, but maybe they're just the, maybe the timeline they got was even longer than 
they had anticipated. I think it's going to be a long time before we get sports like that again. Long time. Uh, the other Biden. Would you go out on an airplane if you were told it had a 98% uh, chance of successful landing? <laughs> yeah, unlikely. A citizen, more accurate analogy, one used as an argument against the repeal of the Voting Rights Act, being out in the rain and saying, I'm going to close my umbrella, I'm not getting wet. Gons, has Bolsonaro been deposed? Angel, Saturday was my birthday. Show far, please. I can do that. I can definitely do that. Seven more. Pajama Boy, Sam, please game on Twitch. Play Call of Duty Warzone with Hassan Piker and E-Girls. Guaranteed content, dude. Pogger. I would love to. I can't tell you how desperate I am to go and buy a gaming system and play. But I have no time. I am in five or 10 minutes, I'm on duty with my son and got to do like some after school extracurricular activities. And then tonight I've got to make dinner for uh, him and my daughter and then put him to bed. And by nine o'clock, when I get him to sleep, I pass out and I got to do a little bit of work. That's my day. Started this morning with doing uh, AM Quickie. Uh, believe me, I have dreams of it. Uh, Rogan Meathead Caucus. Honestly, what uh, good does having Fauci there if you don't listen to him anyway? Seems to me it's just give the media a better excuse to cover his PR briefings. Well, they listen to him a little bit. Uh, Richard Oak, Sam, do one drunk show, please. If it ends per poorly, we'll forgive you. I, I, that, that will happen. That I can almost guarantee will happen. We, we, should, we should do one of those. Maybe we'll do like an evening show one night. Blackhand Jack, I've come around to your thinking that there is no such thing as learning a lesson in politics. I'm one of the dirtbags that voted for Stein in, in 16 after supporting Bernie in the primary because the DNC would see that the left couldn't be ignored and had to be catered to. Guess what? It didn't work. They screwed us even harder this time. And now I see people saying to vote for Howie Hawkins to teach Dems a lesson. So obviously, even the progressives can't learn a lesson either that it doesn't work. Indeed. I think the rhetorical language of not supporting Biden unless there's concessions may be the best path forward. Also, F Jimmy Dore. I agree. We'll talk more about this yesterday, but where are the online complaints about um, Elizabeth Warren not endorsing Bur uh, Biden? Frankie B, uh, what is actually happening in NYC? Everyone is battling with this epidemic, but NYC seems to be in another universe. My heart goes out to you guys. I am not in the city. Matt and Brendan, Michael and Jamie are. And um, my understanding is, is, is what's happening in the hospitals. They are just on the brink of ICUs being overrun citywide. In specific hospitals, it's already done. It, it's already gone over and they've been able to sort of like coordinate across the city. And that's why you hear ambulances apparently 24 seven in New York city, because they are transporting patients and redistributing where the patients are. Brock from VA bookmark the shift in a year bookmark of the shift in a year. Last summer, someone called about their brother defending Pinochet and fascism. He said his brother watched OWN and everyone said, wow, that's nuts. Less than a year later, the president is pro promoting OWN. Local pizza historian party insiders are saying that the club is getting the VP slot. And I just want to know how Clyburn is feeling, knowing what Joe uh, didn't take his advice to choose a woman of color as his running mate. All these people blaming Chinese wet markets like these mother effers have ever been to a red lobster, never been to a red lobster before. Indeed. Um, I, I would be shocked if it's Klobuchar. Boy, oh boy, that would be depressing. And the final I am of the day. Do I really not have a, uh, well, I'll just do one of these. <laughs> reports estimate, the Embonara reports estimate the wildlife trade in China catering to a market of very rich people is around 74 billion a year, even if the government does what it says and cracks down, that's a tremendous amount of money for a black market. Okay, folks, see you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. Feel any better
lips. 